Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Open Metaverse podcast. I'm your host, Mehdi Farooq, Senior Tokenomics Analyst at Endemoka Brands. Today with me, we have a special guest, Mike Dudas, who is a founding partner at Six Men Venture and one of the co-founders of LinksDAO and also has a bit of a celebrity status on crypto Twitter. Mike, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Really, really appreciate it. So Mike, uh, to, kick thing, to kick things off, I would like to lo- learn more about yourself and your journey into crypto. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, I've had a two decade career. I like to say I'm a little bit of like a crypto boomer um, in the sense that you know, I'm in my 40s and spent the first decade of my career. Uh, you know, I'm that you know, sort of classic uh, stereotype, like went to Stanford, you know, graduated in 2001 and the dot-com bust. So I've been seeing boom and busts uh, since <laughs> two decades ago. Uh, so crypto is nothing new for me on that respect. But started my career at Disney, very traditional kind of like media um, uh, business and worked in our cable and broadcasting business and uh, learned a lot working on M&A and consulting. Uh, got an MBA and then uh, ended up at YouTube in 2009. Uh, I'm from the East Coast and I moved to New York and was in New York Tech. Um, and <clears throat> over that decade, learned a tremendous amount, you know, from, from uh, Disney to YouTube to a couple startups in between about kind of like the media and entertainment business. And that's very relevant, you know, to you know, what I'm doing and call it Web3 and NFT related investing. Um, but made a switch in 2010 while at Google into fintech and uh, worked on Google Wallet for a few years. Then I moved over to Venmo and uh, worked at Braintree, was the owner of Venmo. Braintree is very similar to Stripe, a payment processor for online businesses. Um, and at Braintree Venmo, that's where I was introduced to Coinbase. Um, and we were looking to do payment processing uh, and, and Bitcoin payment acceptance for some of our merchants like Uber and Airbnb. Um, that ultimately didn't end up happening. PayPal bought Venmo and I moved on. Um, but I bought my first Bitcoin around then and got very, very interested in this notion of, you know, always on global permissionless uh, networks, uh, you know, Bitcoin being the first and uh, Bitcoin being very much about money. Obviously, now we have uh, you know, these open blockchains that have smart contracts on them and allow for many other types of applications beyond just payments and money movement. So we can get into that. But that was my introduction. Uh, I then spent four years just being a holder of cryptocurrency, but not working on it full time. I founded a mobile commerce company based in New York. But in 20, late 2017, in that kind of like, you know, Ethereum led and Bitcoin led boom, said, hey, you know, some really (laughs) interesting concepts are are being attempted here. You know, things like Filecoin, decentralized storage, things like Chainlink, you know, uh, decentralized oracles, um, you know, Compound and (coughs) Aave and a bunch of other things. So caught my interest. I was still kind of like only interested in Bitcoin and payments, but, you know, looking and curious. Um, And I said, look, I want to jump in in full time because uh, I believe that the things I've been working on in fintech largely aren't, uh, they're not revolutionary, they're evolutionary. They're, you know, basically put some nice UI and a little bit of code on top of the legacy, you know, banking system and financial infrastructure. So, you know, that's what, what got me into, what got me into crypto full time was, uh, you know, being introduced to it in 2013 while at Braintree Venmo, and then working for another number of years on, you know, fintech related things and just not feeling satisfied that what we were doing was uh, you know, revolutionary enough to actually add significant value uh, to the world. So 2018 jumped in full time, or very early 2018. Impressive, impressive background. Um, I want to learn more about Six Men Venture and, and, and your investment criteria for Web3 companies. Um, by the way, you have a very impressive portfolio. When I go through it, I, I kind of get jealous in terms of number of exposure you guys have. Uh, so I would love to learn more how that led, like how that, uh, what was the inspiration behind um, founding Six Men Venture and some and some of the companies when you back them? What's the investment criteria you use? Yeah, good questions. So, um, so to get to the crypto journey and what led to you know starting Six Men Ventures was uh, an evolution in my thinking from 2018 when I entered the space and was sort of really focused primarily on Bitcoin. Um, I started a company called The Block. It's a media and research business uh, in the crypto space. And, you know, in working over a number of years from 2018 through 
2021 when I sold it, early 2021, and I moved to the chairman role in 2020. So it worked like day to day on the business for two years until early 2020. Um, with incredible researchers and journalists, I learned a lot about things beyond Bitcoin. So you know, learned again about Ethereum and smart contracts and the notion that you could have not only permissionless money, but permissionless applications, non-financial applications. And I started to get excited about that and, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily like investing in that, but was looking at the products being created. And, you know, you started to see in 2020 for me, I mean, there were things that were done earlier, but in 2020, uh, you know, started to catch on to NFTs starting to become popular and DeFi becoming popular. So um, financial and non-financial applications and assets. So that really got me interested. And uh, <coughs> so uh, early 2021, I uh, was starting, I basically started actually in mid-2020, started to become an NFT buyer. And by early 2021 was like a, a quiet, you know, quote unquote whale and had started an investment club with some of my you know, friends from college. And you know, we were into everything from NBA Top Shot to art blocks, to crypto punks, to you know, apes, and just created a massive portfolio of NFTs. Um, that led me to realize, look, these are really important, unique and different assets than like liquid tokens and, and the networks. Um, and so decided to start a venture firm uh, to sort of formalize investing. And the original thesis of Six Man Ventures was we're going to invest in just NFTs in the creator economy. As we get into the portfolio, you'll see that we've become you know, something much broader than that. Um, but I will, I think, like many folks who have gone from kind of being money, maybe money maximalists to realizing the true power of, um, you know, smart contract uh, blockchains, the transition and the eye-opening moment happened as you start trading art and collectibles and collecting them and spending time in these communities. Uh, and they're global and they're permissionless and anybody can own them. That was eye-opening for me and what led to the formation of Six Man Ventures. Uh, you then asked, you know, a second question, which, you know, what's your investment criteria? Um, and <clears throat> our big thing is Six Man Ventures the name? It's named after the student basketball club at Stanford, but also the concept is, hey, we're the six man off the bench. You know, we're not the founders of these businesses. We're, we're we have founded companies. I've founded multiple companies, but we're uh, we're there to support the people that we invest in, the founders and the teams. And uh, so it was, you know, like sort of personified us. But what it encapsulates is like we care primarily about the people that we back. Um, so you know, we have areas that we think are important to invest in, and we'll get into those um, as we go through the portfolio. But it's always been about people for us. Like we don't like to work with you know people we dislike or you know who don't we don't believe in the character of. And so we're a people first investment firm, and that means people you want to work with who have you know competence, conviction, uh, and or you know expertise. And you don't have to have all those things. I always like to say, you know, I like to invest and build in the area where there are no experts, right? And I think that's truly almost all of crypto. And so we're on the vanguard. Um, but yeah, the, it's necessary but not sufficient to, to be, you know, uh, a credible, interesting, thoughtful, purpose-driven founder. Uh, and then once you're that, then we can move to the next step of really doing diligence on your business. Um, so you did mention the thesis initially was NFTs in creator economy, but since then has, has, has not the thesis itself, but has uh, the investment scope changed or evolved over the period yeah. of time? Especially? Yeah, great question. So it, it expanded pretty considerably uh, to basically move from NFT and creator economy. We almost sort of dropped the, like we were investing first couple investments. We, I think we had some non crypto things in there. Um, to a fully, you know, crypto native early stage investment firm, uh, and what we invest in, I mean, the the, the you know, buzzword is Web three, but truly, it's it's permissionless financial and non financial applications and the infrastructure to support them. So we don't invest in like the base layer blockchains themselves. We're not L one investors. What we invest in is the ultimately like the protocols projects and products 
that people are using that are built on those networks. And then in infrastructure that supports that, things like fiat on off ramps, things like um, identity primitives, uh, you know, decentralized storage. Uh, and so things to fiat on off ramp, like things that support uh, people, businesses and individuals being able to use these applications. I think it would be a good time to now segue into into your portfolio. So first, we'll go over the verticals, like what are your thematic views, yeah. macro thematic views, and then dive deeper into uh, different dApps uh, within within those verticals. So you got it. You got it. And you'll notice, you know, from a stage perspective, we're early stage investors, right? So we like yes. to lead or co lead rounds at the you know pre seed or seed stage, and then we'll occasionally write Series A checks, but. You know, you're not going to see us investing as much as their wonderful businesses and things like Animoca because uh, that's too mature and late stage for us. Yeah. Uh, so starting with data analytics, what's the overarching uh, macro thesis or macro view on data and analytics for, for Six Men Venture? Yeah. So the uh, overarching belief is that, you know, our so so a couple things. One is that our data is valuable. Um, and so, you know, we've invested, some of the companies aren't on here, they're in stealth, but that our data is valuable, that we should own it and that you know, people will potentially pay us for that data. Um, so that's one thesis that we have, uh, and that, you know, we can kind of like selectively choose who to share that valuable data with, and we should own that. Uh, a second thing is there is not just personal data, but there's general data that's out there. Uh, that is really hard, that's difficult for people to parse. And so we, let, we, we like to invest in companies that make that you know, data available to a broader set of folks and you know, make it easier to understand. Impressive. Uh, what about gaming? Like, What's the overview in terms of how you guys are thinking about gaming? I see a lot of AI projects as well, ASM and LET AI. So what's the thesis there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we think, you know, while it's kind of early in terms of games that have truly and sustainably, we're early stage investors. So we have a many multi-year horizon and we have a number of investments in uh, a mixture of like play and earn gaming, as you mentioned, uh, in AI to support, you know, online gaming and metaverse related businesses. Um, but the overarching thesis is that, again, that there will be not everybody in the world, but a subset of uh, gamers. And that's like billions of people are gamers, right? So a subset of that can be rather large. Uh, but that these folks will want to have composable games, meaning they'll want to basically be able to take assets from one place to another. They'll want to have ownership of, you know, things that they earn through their work. You know, you've heard of play and earn or free to own. There are a bunch of different models. Um, but our, our core thesis is just we think that, you know, tokens, both fungible and non-fungible and ownership of, you know, the work uh, and of the fun uh, and of the time that you spend playing these games uh, you know, should accrue to you in, in many ways. Now, not everybody cares about that. So I don't know that the addressable market for these games will ultimately be as large as, you know, all of gaming. But what I do think is that the power users and the people who do care about it, the whales, will um, will be very, very significant uh, in terms of how much they're, they're worth. Um, our other thesis is like, you know, we don't have a chain specific thesis. We're looking for, you know, not everything needs to be on chain today. Um, in our belief, certainly the transfers of value need to be. Um, and then, you know, we invest across some blockchains, but not all, right? So the Ethereum ecosystem, Polygon, uh, Solana, Avalanche, uh, but we haven't invested, I won't name like where we don't invest, but like we haven't invested in every blockchain. Either. That's interesting. So in terms of a fair, like right now we have 130 L1s, we have new L1s coming, we have new L2s emerging. Uh, so you, you did mention few few ecosystem. Are there any one or two specific ecosystem as a user or as an investor you're particularly bullish on or you see a lot of activity recently in terms of project trying to build on top? Yeah, of that I think you... it ties to like our expertise and where we invested. So we're, we're you know, particularly bullish on the Ethereum ecosystem, right? It's the most mature. Now, saying the Ethereum ecosystem can mean so many different things, right? You have people bullish on roll-ups like, you know, Optimism and, so, you know, others folks built more bullish on Arbitrum. Um, and you have, you know, still more, ZK, you know, Sync and others coming. 
Um, and then you have kind of like, you know, call it L, uh, side chains or, or different types of L2s like Polygon. So, you know, we invest more in the, entre- and, and, and then you have like full, like EVM compatible chains separate from Ethereum like Avalanche. We invest primarily in, as I mentioned earlier, the teams and uh, we have like beliefs. So, so like if you're in the Ethereum ecosystem broadly, like we're, we're con- comfortable that if you've said, that, hey, this is the environment that we want to build in um, and this is where we believe we can attract gamers, like we'll, we'll, ba- we'll support that. Uh, another is Solana, right? Like we invest in the Solana ecosystem. Uh, we've had success there with Stepin, with Magic Eden. Uh, there are definitely users there. Uh, and so you know, those are probably the two primary areas that we invest. Uh, we're starting to look not live on mainnet yet from a gaming from a gaming perspective at SWE um, because they are definitely optimizing that blockchain uh, for gaming. An area that we've collected but haven't done a ton of investing on yet is, is Flow. Uh, we're, we're certainly looking there, but we just haven't found the right deals ourselves. And by the way, some of this is just, you know, small team, right? We have five full-time folks. You can only focus on so many chains. So uh, it's not that the other chains necessarily aren't things we're excited about. It's just that, you know, you have a certain area and where you can focus. And so we focus in the Ethereum ecosystem, Solana, and we're looking more at like SWE and Aptos because we think move language and the consensus mechanism there will be uh, promising for these types of like high throughput applications like games. Uh, I echo a similar sentiment with, with regards to the new chains as well, uh, especially SWE. Um, so going coming back to the different verticals, one of the um, one another vertical you guys have recently heavily invested in is identity and, and social primitives. Uh, so what are your views on that? And also, all in all, some of the projects you're bullish on across category that you think are doing interesting things or perhaps some weird things, but could lead to a massive innovation within Web3 or are targeting a big market and a lot of people are, a lot of people do not know about it? Yeah, good question. So, uh, you know, the things that, so, so there's a couple different kinds of businesses, um, you know, that, that we've invested in an identity. Uh, one is, you know, basically credentials that are issued by credible financial institutions. Uh, Portable is a company that we've backed where a financial institution can issue an on-chain credential after doing you know, some form of identity verification, KYC, it could be my passport, it could be my driver's license. Um, and then I, as the individual, have the ability to make that uh, on-chain information available to other applications. And then those other applications can choose whether to accept it. So they can say, oh, the entity that issued that credential uh, is one that I trust, therefore I'll trust entity A, you know, that bank or that financial institution's uh, verification of Mike Dudas's identity info. Okay. So you're trying to build up literally a sort of decentralized identity network that I as the individual um, can share. I think that approach is really important because I find it hard to believe some other approaches that people are taking are trying to actually start with the individual themselves and being like, Oh, Mike, claim all of your uh, online reputation stuff. And, you know, basically, you know, create your web three identity. And I think that's going to be a little bit more difficult because I'm just not certain that individuals care to do that. But when it ties to something I have to do already, like I need to KYC uh, and therefore I'm giving this information. Well, okay, well, why not then do that on chain? Where I can share it with other um, with other entities. The uh, the other areas that we're interested in are things that make identity uh, not necessarily like my KYC identity, but just maybe my on chain information. Like Token Proof is a good example. They know, for example, that I hold a LinksDAO NFT or I hold a Board Ape Yacht Club NFT. They use that token, that NFT, um, as a proxy to grant me access to uh, different things. Uh, in the case, uh, it could be, you know, LinksDAO offers select merchandise. It could be that Board Ape Yacht Club offers tickets to an event. Um, and so it's cool. It's like, hey, you know, this part of my identity and ownership you know, can be used. And then uh, another last one, Galaxy, you know, that I'll mention issues uh, credentials for accomplishing tasks. Layer 3 and Rabbit Hole do that as well. 
quests or tasks. And um, those credentials can actually earn me tokens in some cases, earn me status. I think that's a really interesting way. So that on-chain identity, um, while you know, useful for different purposes than what Portable does, is, is fairly cool, you know? And, and useful, sorry, not just cool, but, but useful as I'm like sort of building up, learning, earning, and want to provably say that, you know, I have this competency or that competency. Awesome. Uh, last time we had Stephen McKinn, he kind of echoes similar uh, thesis, uh, slightly different, like, but, but kind of similar thesis and also very bullish on reputation layer and, and social credentials and, and things like that. Um, so apart from this, what do you think at the moment in the market, what are some of the Web3 domains that you think are underappreciated, underrated, but has a large market, large time? So for example, uh, some of the some of the things, including proof of useful work, so decentralized Uber, decentralized Airbnb. I think that this is one of the theme that hasn't taken off that much, in in my opinion. And I remain quite bullish on it, and I feel it's kind of underrated at the moment. Uh, so, what are some of those domains, in your opinion, that market do not appreciate at the moment, but I think could you you think could be massive? Uh, going yeah. Through? So I'll just I'll start with an obvious one, uh, which is uh, you know. Decentral DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. So there's, it, but so I think it's sensible to be very cautious and concerned about in the very near term investing in DAOs because there's so much regulatory uncertainty around these structures and around whether, um, you know, one, the regulatory issues, two, whether they actually work from a functional perspective, like can you govern uh, properly, like we've seen issues in DeFi governance and other areas. Um, so I'm in the very long term, I'm very bullish on DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, like organizations for specific things that aren't run like top down companies. Um, but in the near term, uh, you're, you're seeing they're not extremely popular. Uh, it's not a popular structure to pursue. And, you know, it's not just the DAOs themselves. The infrastructure isn't necessarily, necessarily there to support them. Things like, you know, private payments, things like, you know, call it anonymous, but token based, you know, discussion and voting. And, and just people don't understand these systems well enough, I think, to design them. So we're just like so early in the learning curve. Um, and so... I, you know, I advise people many times today that like creating a DAO, uh, you know, maybe straight out of the gate is, is actually a way maybe to slow down your project versus uh, to accelerate learning and knowledge. So, you know, that's one area that you, know, I would say it probably remain undervalued and, and I'm not supremely bullish in, in the near term and the long term very much. So, um, you know, look, like DeFi volumes are way down. Just DeFi broadly has fallen out of favor uh, just from a price perspective. If you look at the public price of, you know, the, the tokens of these products and if you look at the you know, total value locked. Um, so I think DeFi has been out of favor from a fundraising perspective and a usage perspective. And I think that will change. But a lot of you know, some things that have to happen for that to change are unlocking you know, a larger market right now, much of DeFi is self-referential. Uh, it's just, hey, you know, basically I'm borrowing so I can long, you know, these other assets. And so that's great in a bull market. You see a lot of demand for DeFi. You don't see it in, in bearish markets or um, I need to hedge. It's just very self-referential to the tokens. We need more, you know, interesting assets, non-fungible assets, real world assets, just a larger set of collateral Um and you know, real world value that people are you know, borrowing, lending against, and trading uh, for DeFi to really work. And I think that's going to take years. So kind of again, near term unpopular, long term uh, very bullish on. Those are two really broad categories. Uh, probably we'll just stop there because you know I think you can see it in the investment flows, but I think you'll see those flows change. I think DeFi you'll see flows change back to bullish over 2023. I think it's actually going to take longer for DAOs. So, so with regards to DeFi, do you think one of the issues could have been uh, the value accrual of the tokens? The tokens could not properly accrue value from all the activity that happens on DeFi. And also, what do you think is stopping a lot of real-world asset coming coming to DeFi? Is it is it because of liquidity? Is it 
because of regulation? Uh, what are some of the things that you see that has kind of stopped it? Yeah, so I think the first question, uh, it's it's less about token prices. Well, so I think what happened is I think it looked like there was more DeFi activity because of things like yield farming and token rewards and token incentives. So, yeah, I mean, of course, like there's less DeFi activity because there's fewer of those rewards and token prices are down. But ultimately, the underlying products themselves also aren't as attractive, right? The yields, for example, and land borrow markets are just not as attractive. Um and so, you know, for for, uh, for for people who are lending, you know, I'm not getting a return, like a significant return. I might as well just park the money. You know, interest rates have increased, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of your second question on real world assets, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really complex. Uh, one, uh, it's hard to get traditional, you know, hard asset owners to participate in DeFi, like it just why would I right now? It's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a tough sell, you know, what's, what's the upside. And, and, you know, so getting that flywheel started is, is going to be really challenging. It'll probably start with, again, things like collectibles and things that I think crypto native people are naturally interested in and then move more into other asset classes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, and then, you know, I think regulatory uncertainty around tokenizing, uh, hard assets and, just getting a real framework around uh, you know, if you're in DeFi, can you do DeFi with things that are effectively tokenized securities, right? Like if I took, I'm just throwing out an apartment building or piece of land um, and I tokenize it, it, like, is that, is that, that's a security? How does that participate? You know, how do you get that into DeFi? That's a problem, a thorny problem that hasn't been solved yet. Um, we did discuss DAO, and I think it would be unfair if you didn't talk about LinksDAO. So tell us a little bit about LinksDAO and what were some of the lessons you learned while you were founding it? Yeah, so LinksDAO, uh, you know, to, to start, as I mentioned, DAOs are difficult. It's, it's not a true DAO, right? It's, an air, it's a decentralized autonomous organization. Now, the spirit and intent at the beginning was we was, we wanted to create a DAO out of the gate. What we quickly found was that um, from a legal and regulatory perspective, there was a lot of uncertainty around, you know, issuing a liquid token, for example, and can you even do that in the United States? So ultimately, we structured LinksDAO as a corporation, okay? A corporation where, uh, so, so what LinksDAO is, is it's a global golf and leisure membership club. So, um, you, we sold NFTs and, and, you know, they trade on secondary markets as well, but people hold NFTs and those NFTs give them one, the right to purchase a membership into a physical golf club that we're purchasing. Okay. That links down Inc. anyone, anywhere in the world can buy a membership to that club. You get a bunch of perks and benefits. We have like massive discounts to premier golf brands, things like Callaway and Top Golf and Ship Sticks and others. Okay. Um, Bridgetown. <clears throat> and then third, you get the ability, and there are other benefits, but third, you get the ability to uh, actually vote on things around the golf club, like where it will be located, the properties of the course, you know, the architects that we're considering. Uh, and then you get to participate in, you know, a token gated community. Um, where we've created a global golf association where like you could play at my, you could request to play at my golf course. I can request to play at yours. So some really cool things uh, and then benefits and perks by holding the NFTs with other uh, communities, sports related and not. Um, so that's the cool thing about NFTs is they're composable and they can give you benefits in other people's projects. Um, so anyway, the project has been a success in that we have a great community um, we were able to, with uh, the NFT fundraise and a subsequent equity fundraise, hire a team for LinksDAO, the corporation. Um, and what we found is having a you know, corporate team execute was necessary. So in other words, having a DAO with 5,500 people you know, who just collectively make a bunch of decisions was going to slow us down significantly and make it really difficult to achieve the vision. I think many uh, projects that have looked at DAO structures and maybe even have started out with them have found this. It's very difficult 
to do certain things, especially things that require you know specialized expertise and things of that nature in a DAO structure. Okay. So anyway, Lynx DAO is a corporation, <clears throat> and we the members uh, instead of being part of a DAO are part of an advisory board that effectively votes on the direction of all key uh, material things that the company does. Okay. And it's been fun and interesting. Um, and what we've, the big learning was people were really comfortable with that structure. The only thing they really care about is just deliver the thing that you said you were going to deliver, which is a golf course. And we haven't bought the golf course yet because we are looking for like the absolute one of the best in the world, right location, accessible to the largest group of people. Um, and so that takes time. But in the meantime, you know, people have been very happy with the other benefits they've been given and uh, and the ability to participate in an awesome global community that anybody can join. Um, just to clarify, so these NFT holders, would they have access to the ownership of these golf courses or are there other benefits? Thank yeah, you. no, not via ownership of the NFT. That would be an unregistered security sale. So you can't like sell an NFT to anyone anywhere in the world and then go purchase assets and have the NFT convey ownership of that asset. Yeah. But apart from that, even the other perks, the composable perks, the membership benefits. Are yeah, those perks you get and the ability to purchase a membership, but there's no ownership in the ultimate assets. That comes to equity holders. What we did offer is we offered all NFT holders who were accredited, so who are eligible to purchase equity in a private business, to do so. And we had um, a number, a very significant number of members who did purchase equity in actual in the actual company. All right. All right. So it did provide access control towards becoming an equity owner of these clubs. Okay. Yeah. So, but you had to be accredited. You know, this is the trick, tricky thing with, with equity. Um, yeah. Securities to... regulation even bothers us as token design. Like when intense, we are designing yeah. token, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't want to be non-compliant. <laughs> Um, so apart from your links, uh, apart from links, I also wanted to explore your NFT collection. So what do you collect? What verticals do you target? And what, like, what's your mental model for selection of these uh, yeah, collections? Great question. So I collect uh, primarily on Ethereum and uh, on Solana. Uh, and I collect things that uh, I, so I collect three different categories, really. Um, <clears throat> I collect... Uh, I started with collectibles, but then I was like, you know, it's, I'm just not that into it. So the sports collectibles, like I made a top shot got me into it. It was interesting for a while, but I just don't really, I collected baseball cards when I was young and it's just not, it doesn't excite me as much. Um, so I've focused primarily on, you know, call it the PFP type communities, uh, a select group that I believe are really interesting. And in the long run will deliver, um, you know, meaningful experiences or deliver meaningful community. So, you know, my profile picture on Twitter and elsewhere, LinkedIn is a crypto punk. So that <clears throat> I participate in that one, one, because I think it's a grail that will appreciate in value. But two, I really believe in that, like it was a free mint many, many years ago, one of the original NFT projects so it has historical value. And the community is full of OGs and really fantastic people meets up in real life, has online communications and a telegram group and discord. And so just, I really enjoy that community and like being a part of it. And like, I like my like online identity. I like tying it to that. So that's one. Um, then you have the PFP ones, like we were just talking about like board apes. Um, and I like that one because, you know, <clears throat> they have a long-term you know, vision of, and are well-funded and I believe can, deliver a really cool gaming and, you know, metaverse experience. So I want to see that play out. Um, and then I really like uh, generative art. So I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big collector of, um, a big collector of like actual, like art, direct artist created, human created art, but of generative art. I find it fascinating and, and specific to the digital and online format that we're in. Um, so I've collected primarily like art blocks. And you mentioned you had Steven on here. They're obviously investors in art blocks. I'm not, but I'm just fascinated by it. And so I, I you know, collected Fidenzas and Ringers and, uh, you know, Squiggle, Chromie Squiggles, 
um, and meridians. And, you know, I just think a lot of them, those are beautiful. And, you know, when I, when I don't live in New York city and I have a space big enough to, you know, accommodate, I, I look forward to printing some of those out and putting them on the wall as well as having, you know, really sizable digital frames. So I like to collect that art. Uh, and then, you know, Solana, it's a little bit more, call it degen, a little more, you know, fun and speculative and trading. And I have fun over there. I don't know that the stuff that I've seen to date there will have as much historical value, but some of it will, you know. So there's a project called SMB, Solana Monkey Business, that's sort of the crypto punk esque community of Solana. I really, really enjoy owning that. Um, but the rest of the stuff, and, uh, you know, mainly I just, sort of trade for fun. And I, it's more because I like the people that I'm trading with. And I do that. And again, some discord and telegram groups, and we just we have a blast with it. And that's a little more speculative. Excellent. And by the way, impressive collection. Uh, you covered all, all, all the blue chip <laughs> NFTs. Yeah. Uh, and also... you know, I'm not into Tezos, for example. Not, and I think what's happening there is wonderful. And but 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 again, it's just my style isn't to collect like direct directly collect art and hold it. The last piece, sorry, I, I just failed to mention membership NFTs. Like I own a LinksDAO NFT. I, um, I've owned Pool Suite, right? Like different communities, uh, garage.xyz, different communities that I find interesting. And I think those will grow in uh, prominence in the coming years where, you know, you're not necessarily looking for a direct financial return or appreciation, but for you know, the delivery of value um, through that membership. Also, are you part of any investment DAOs um, in terms of membership or excess? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, Pleaser, Pleaser DAO uh, is the only one I think at this time. Oh, and then a yeah, private one, like a much smaller one. But in terms of like the prominent ones, Pleaser. Awesome. Um, yeah, what a collection. Um, so in terms of like, I also wanted to ask one philosophical question because it, it came up again and again. So in your views, what are tokens? And when does it make sense for an investor to invest in tokens versus equity when given a choice? Let's say, assume there's no... Uh, warrant in equity. So so when would it make sense uh, to just primarily invest in tokens versus equity? Yeah. So uh, if if it's a you know network that requires over time, it, we invest in different businesses, different types of businesses. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, some are centralized businesses. It could be an infrastructure company that is offering fiat on off ramps and it needs to be centralized to be comp compliant with regulations. They don't need a token. So we'll invest in equity there where we invest in. Um, and, and in many of the companies, by the way, where we think there may be a need for a token down the road, we still will invest typically in equity. So we're owners of the company because that's where you have sort of legal rights and benefits under today's structure, but you may get like a token warrant or a right to purchase a token in the future. Okay. So when do we invest in tokens? Meaning whether it's equity with token warrant, whether it's directly into a token in a private sale or a you know, simple agreement for a future token called a SAFT, we invest when we believe that, uh, as I mentioned, that um, a protocol is necessary to allow for uh, effectively decentralized uh, operations of a you know, project, a network, or a business. And where uh, basically the way that you incentivize usage of that protocol, where you um, help for coordination of activity on that protocol, where you pay and or reward people for utilizing the protocol in whatever way, shape or form is necessary, whether it's through validating transactions like security, whether it's through, you know, staking in order to uh, help generate fees or provide liquidity. Um, but we have to believe that the token is instrumental in uh, both the operation of the protocol and that uh, it can't be accomplished you know, in a equity based business. Otherwise, it's just like theatrics and, and you know, why have a token? And the spirit is that <clears throat> over time, if you have these tokens that have multiple functions within a network, um, they'll have value to different people for different reasons. And even if they start out, you've heard of like progressive decentralization, even if they start out 
where you see, you know, maybe a little bit heavier ownership amongst the people who create the protocol, amongst investors, whether it's professionals like VCs or whether it's individuals uh, and private sales or early folks early the protocol. Over time, as the network gets used and grows, you'll see those tokens move out to the actual people who are utilizing, again, the protocol, who are using the product or service or who are providing the product or service. So, so when a project seeks tokenomics advice from, from you guys, like what's one key advice you give them? Like you gave one in terms of thinking along the lines of progressive decentralization. That could also mean not to have a capped supply. Maybe over the period of time, the supply grows to kind of uh, decentralize the network. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe assume a, assume a case where, uh, let's say, the investors kind of offload and when they offload the community and the rest of the world can can have yeah so I'll, I'll be i'll probably so i'm we do have a token design team here um and it's a couple of my partners carl and and mustafa um so i would say i'm not like our token economics and design expert so i'll go even more simple than that so the first is you know don't introduce a token unless it's necessary and until you have very explicit understanding of how the token will operate within both the economic, but also the product design of your protocol. That's one obvious thing. Uh, two, be extremely transparent at far in advance of launching the token about uh, the token economics, about the justification for the token, uh, about, you know, what you just mentioned, like whether there's future inflation, the different stakeholders explaining it, have discussion and dialogue around it and really make sure that it's it's simple enough uh, for folks within the uh, ecosystem and who will be utilizing your protocol to understand. Um, there's a lot of like just weird, confusing, messed up token economics that nonstop changes uh, because people don't understand it and that's sent projects to zero or, you know, created unsustainable economic booms and bust cycles. Um, I think simplicity ties to that, uh, you know, dual token models and things of that nature can, can be really confusing. I mean, they're necessary. And uh, another thing, because we invest in gaming quite a bit, um, you know, don't only think of, you know, sort of value accrual to fungible tokens, but also, in many cases, uh, non-fungible tokens, unique assets uh, will you know, provide interesting value within uh, you know, your game, product, or ecosystem. 100%. That's a sound advice. And that's also advice we give to a lot of projects, gaming projects that we advise that thinking along the lines of NFT for value accrual sometimes could be very, it could be important and it could lead to uh, more network effects. We've even kept at links the governance, as I mentioned, at the NFT level versus, versus releasing a liquid token that could you know, basically go to people who don't really care or have a deep passion for the project governing, right? Like in our case, we want the members to be governing and voting, not just some liquid token holder speculator. Uh, so, Mike, in the future, can we expect uh, a fungible token for Lynx DAO? Uh, Great question. We have to uh, we have to basically determine the legal and regulatory uh, and environment for such an offering, if that were to ever happen. One, two, to the advice I just gave, there has to be a real legitimate purpose for the token within the project and the ecosystem and the community. Um, and I think we have some ideas on what those could be, um, but you really need to work them out. Uh, and frankly, we need more, we, the project needs to be further along. Like you need to actually have like the physical golf course and some of the other product offerings before you would even contemplate token economics. Uh, but you know, I, I would love it down the road. Uh, if, and again, I've already said to date, you know, it's links Dow Inc, right? Like you would need to have a truly, you know, decentralized operation and protocol and reason for the token to exist. So, you know, we, we'd like to move in that direction, but there are so many variables. And what's cool is like, you know, we're doing this in a venture timeline, like 
I want to build this project and the team wants to build it over decades. Right. So like, there's not a rush too many teams rushed and you know, launch tokens because hey, it's a bull market. Yes. Love it. Love it. Um, so, so we're now entering at the last segment of the podcast and we just ask a couple of fun questions. So the first fun question was Mike, what was the last thing you have Googled? Uh, the last thing that I Googled, uh, Great could be question. crypto, could be non-crypto. Yeah, let me uh, let me check my history. Um, <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, Ethereum price uh, it was the last thing that I googled, and it was because the price was jumping. Uh, I was following the Sam Bankman-Fried SBF news this morning, so I think people have found it bullish, and I think there was some CPI data that came out today. Yeah, very positive. And I think we're going to be in this kind of like like this you know, for a bit, um, you know, not really moving. So I, I don't have like, I'm not a trader per se, but like, you know, I was you know, holding a little bit more ETH than I have over the last six months. And so it kind of spiked up. So I, I sold a little bit of my ETH and <laughs> not because I don't believe it, but I'm just like, I was like, uh, you know what? I, I, I like the dollars right now. So I, I was looking at the Ethereum price. Um, so we have seen walk to earn, meditate to earn, Eat to earn. If there was any X to earn application that you would like to see or you personally use, we would love to know. Yeah, so we just invested in one. It's not quite public yet, um, but a sleep and earn app um, that I use daily and I love. And it's not even about a liquid token, it's about earning these NFTs and designing a room um, for yourself that you can kind of like flex. And ultimately, it will have. Uh, some really interesting benefits tied to, you know, if you have great sleep, you earn more NFTs, you can upgrade, you'll get rewards. And then you can use those things for, you know, I won't name specific sleep related or health related goods, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting and a great team. Um, so I think, you know, where you add, you know, take a normal app, a sleep app and add this like gamification via NFTs. Uh, and perhaps eventually a liquid token. Uh, that to me is something that's sustainable and and promising versus, you know, really trying to like reinvent the wheel and cause people to do things to earn tokens. I don't think that's going to go well. I think another one is just like check in and earn. So like loyalty, it won't look exactly like Yelp or Foursquare, but like you'll basically be able to earn, you know, some points and NFTs and things for loyalty to restaurants or other places that you go. Those are two fun ones. Uh, yeah, sleep to earn. Uh, I think even the last podcast guest we had, uh, Steven mentioned it as well. He's one invested project, in the same company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is this, Okay, so I, I, I won't disclose it then. Uh, um, well, if he disclosed it, you can. I think it's Sleep Agachi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, is yeah, it yeah. correct? Yeah, so we led around into Sleep Agachi. They invested as well. All right, great. Um, to wrap up the interview, Mike, it was, by the way, a lovely interview. Uh, what should I have asked you, but I didn't? Ah, uh, great question. Um, what should you have asked me but didn't? Uh, I would say, uh, why are you bullish on a, a multi-chain future? You know, and and for me, I think it's uh, you know that you're going to have so much usage on uh, of these blockchains. Like, I really believe. Um, that the exchange of value on permissionless blockchains, you know, billions of people will be touched by this over the next few decades. And I don't think that a single architecture or a single, you know, single layer one will be sufficient nor desirable, um, you know, for that type of usage. You're going to have different designs. Uh, now, I don't think we'll have 100 use you know, broadly used layer ones, but we'll have definitely more than one. It won't just be Ethereum. Yeah, definitely agreed with you. A uh, couple of days ago, I was in Hacker House with Layer Zero. It allows cross-chain communication with different layer ones. And a lot of innovations is also happening on that front where a lot of projects are leveraging it to build cross-chain utility and governance uh, for, for the ecosystem. Uh, so Mike, it was great to have you. It was a lovely podcast. I, I, I got to learn a lot as well. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for coming to the Open Metaverse podcast. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any opinions provided in this podcast reflect the views of the speakers only.